afternoon. Um, I'll be talking about my master research. In there, I focus on water modernity and violence in the Colombian Caribbean. Just to start, I know it's kind of obvious that Colombia is here, very near the equator and in this area. The, where the place I'm going to be speaking about is here, a little bit more north. And well, yeah, this is a picture of one of the steel towns. It's one of the only three communities in the entire world who live entirely on water. So they are very particular. And well, in this presentation, I want to discuss these four issues. First of all, uh, I see water as political. Therefore, I use the concept of waterscape. And um, what does that mean to see water as political? That we don't see it as just a natural element, but also decisions taken about it have influence in social changes and also are embedded with power. I use the concept of waterscape uh, developed by Eric Zwingbegadau, I cannot pronounce that correctly, and he says that not a single, in, in waterscapes, not a single form of social change can be understood without simultaneously addressing and understanding the transformations of and in the hydrological processes. So that's, that's the main idea that's going to be running through the whole presentation. The second thing I want to discuss is how in this area I find that it was modernity discourses that were the main drivers of the waterscape transformation. Um, by modernity, uh, it's a very huge uh, uh, concept, especially in historical studies. But here I am referring especially to this idea of overcoming of poverty by increasing production. This main idea is very closely related to the revolution, uh, the industrial revolution, and to the idea of progress. And in this particular landscape, uh, waterscape, sorry, <laughs> it reflected in the construction of infrastructure and violence. Third, uh, also I want this presentation to come into the debate of violence in Colombia. As you know, Colombia has been a country that has been affected by a 60-year-long uh, armed conflict. Um, we signed the peace, but recent events in January um, uh, started again the, the war, uh, the armed work, war between different actors. Um, and this, this conflict has been read mainly in terms of land problems. What I want to give with this presentation is that it is a conflict of land, but also it's very important to take into account all other aspects of it, and in this case, especially water. Um, the fourth thing I, wanna, I want you to take from this is that um, the value of historic approaches in research, researching social environmental issues. So speaking about that, here is a map of Colombia, and now you know where it is. And I'm going to be talking about this area mostly, the Cienaga Grande de Santa Marta. No, go back. <laughs> and uh, what I wanted to show you with this map is that Colombia is a country that is very rich in water resources. Uh, we have Three mountain chains, you can imagine all the water that comes from it. Uh, also, we're in the tropics. Uh, we have the most humid place in the world. So we have tons of water. Uh, the Amazon runs right here. Uh, but our main river is the Magdalena River. And it runs just right here. It's this big river that comes and, and just in the area that I focus my research on. Uh, it's very important because most of the population of the country uh, is, is around this Magdalena River. So you can imagine all the sewages and all the disposal of things go through this river and obviously go to end up in the, in the delta. So um, here is a map of the 19th century of the area that I'm researching, the Cienaga Grande Santa Marta. Um, you can see here how it was clear back then the connection with the Magdalena River and all how it, it was nurturing the Cienaga. Um, but this side you can see is a bit empty. In the 20th century, uh, this is before uh, the first half of the 20th century, you can see much more detail in the areas, uh, in, in the streams that nurture this, this, this main lagoon. However, <coughs> we go uh, to Google Maps and all these things. Nowadays, all these um, small fluents and, and, and water streams are not that clear, but you can see now the, uh, the existence of main roads all around the area. 
uh, where these streams used to be communicating some fluidly. And this is the Google Earth view. And to describe what is the Cienaga Grande Santa Marta, it's a waterscape, as I mentioned before, uh, where the coastal lagoon of 450 square kilometers is the most noticeable mark of the waterscape and where high temperatures and water conditions determine the development of particular way of living. So this is the Cienaga, so it's a coastal lagoon, it's an estuary lagoon, it mixes both um, fresh water and salty water. Um, it's very uh, strategically located, it's the delta, is in the delta of this river. It has one, the biggest city um, of the Caribbean region on one side, Barranquilla, another big city on the other side, Santa Marta. No, don't go. Oh. Um, another small town that uh, has a large population with is Cienaga. Its name, you can guess, comes from the Cienaga Grande. Um, you can see this huge mountain here. Imagine how tall it is if being in the middle of the tropics, it has perpetual snows. It's a very high mountain. And actually, um, some geolo geologists have claimed that the Cienaga was formed because of the movement on the tectonic plates that created the, 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 this mountain, the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta, um, moved the delta of the Magdana River a little bit to the west. So leaving this, this area that was with in 2,300 years filled with uh, all the water that was receiving. Um, yeah, so this area is very, very uh, rich for agriculture. Uh, this, uh, this is what is called alluvial plains. Uh, it's, it's areas where some part of the year, summer, will be, we only have two, two main seasons, uh, rainy and more rainy. <laughs> so in the summer, this one is very dry, and with in the rainy, more rainy area, it comes and floods. So it, it appears and disappears. And on this side, you saw in the map before all the connections that it has with the main river, so it's a very swampy area. And here is the sea. So uh, for you, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you to have a little patience with me. I'll be coming back to this map or, or reference to it because it's very important. So yeah, now, actually going to the research. So a little bit of facts that I know they are important. So it is the Cienaga is loca located in the Peri-Caribbean arid belt. It's hot. The Cienaga, it's extremely hot. Uh, you have no idea until you're there. It's very, it's 38 degrees mostly of, most of the time, and it's also very humid. So you need to carry a bottle this big of water to only survive. Uh, it's affected by El Nino Southern Oscillation Climate Pattern. And there is a water deficit because of the high temperatures causing more evaporation than the income of water. Uh, it has several eco districts around. Uh, coastal lagoon, mangrove plain, flood plain, coastal plain, marine area, salt <coughs> pans, dunes, uh, and the, this ag uh, agricultural region I told you before. It's beautiful. The Cienaga is absolutely beautiful. It's absolutely diverse. It has been declared, it has two national, uh, nat nature, national natural parks inside. It's recognized as a Ramsar protected area. It is a sanctuary of flora and fauna. It's an also exclusive reserve importance of bird and a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve. It's gorgeous, there is no doubt of that. <laughs> um, and despite um, all the abundance of water coming from all these places, from the main river, from the small rivers coming down the mountain, from the sea, from all the connections from the south, there is not one source of drinking water for the population living around. Right now, nowadays, there are 11 municipalities living in, around this area. So it's a quite um, important contra contrast, isn't it? having all this water and very few for people to drink, not or not. They all depend on um, going up streams in the rivers to get some fresh water or to have some trucks bringing water every day from the big, big cities. So, uh, about the human population in the area, um, indigenous people have used the Cienaga historically before the, the arrival of the Spaniards as a place of fishing. They had some infrastructure to control the floods uh, a bit more to the south, but the, the Cienaga has been considered mainly as a place for fishing. Um, with time, in the, in the mid of the 19th century, the first populations came to arrive and live in this area. So uh, it was mainly fishermen. So up until the 
1950s, we can surely say that people who live in the area were mainly fishermen that came to the region to find fish. However, in the mountain side, um, there was a big banana economy precedent. Um, by the 1920s, the United Fruit Company had built a railway and had a huge amount of production of banana in this area. Uh, I cannot talk about this banana economy without talking about the, the massacre, the United Fruit Company, um, how do you say, it's, um, inflicted into the workers when they were striking. Um, but this economy was huge. It came to an end in, in the 30s, mainly for the economic um, uh, disaster in 1927. But yeah, it was really, really important in the area. It's important for my case study as a, as a president because the United Fruit Company had enough economic capacity to build a huge amount of infrastructure to control water uh, for banana plantation. That means that all the streams that were coming from the mountain to the Cienega were controlled. So uh, 148,400 meters for irrigation uh, were built by the company, which is a huge amount if you, if you start thinking about it. And they built 16 canals in six river regions with an altogether volume of 30,000 liters per second that benefited the people who could afford to be involved in the, in the banana industry. That was mostly the elites from the local elites, not the peasants nor the fishermen that were in the area. Um, the banana came to an end, but it did leave a precedent of, of elites being empowered in the control of water. So my main period of interest is, is the second half of the 20th century and, and the beginning of, of the 21st century. Uh, as I said before, I reckon that what um, affected mo <coughs> mostly the configuration of the waterscape in the Cienega, Grande de Santa Marta, was the, the discourse of modernity. And this discourse had already identified two sets of, of um, stakeholders. The fisherman population who were in small scale, who were um, uh, very uh, rudimentary compared with the big infrastructure that the banana agribusiness could bring. So uh, this started and triggered some processes for very uh, ambiguous um, policies in, in both in the national and institutional scale and in the regional scale. Here again, I will separate the presentations into bits. They will run parallelly in time, but the national institutional scale uh, is, is about how the government mainly saw the, the area, and then I will refer to the local population. So the national state, how much time do I get? Uh, uh, the national state um, show great ambiguity. So as a bit of international com uh, context, you know the Alliance for Progress, where the US tried to modernize in their own terms Latin America, uh, the Green Revolution, and in the national context, Colombia has been a very violent uh, country since the beginning. By violence, I mean, um, the, I use the, the concept from Charles Tilly of uh, communal violence, uh, collective violence, where mo um, several individuals are, are, are in involved in inflicting violence upon other, other, sectors, other actors. So in the violence, uh, this period, known as La, Vi La Violencia, that ran from the 48 to 58, uh, two political parties were disputing the territory. It's very important because mo a lot of population fled to other areas, including the Cienega, to, to uh, flee away from the conflict. The Curry Plan uh, was a, a plan by the, um, uh, a Canadian guy called Lockling Curry, and he basically said that if Colombia wanted to get out of poverty, they need, we needed to increase production uh, to decrease pr uh, poverty. That, that was the main plan. And how did he manage to say that was going to happen? Through infrastructure, building tons of infrastructure to be able to get all the crops and all the production out. The agrarian reform happened after the Curry Plan. After the violence finally ended, the government tried to, seek to avoid the conditions for this conflict to repeat itself. So he, the government tried to give lands uh, to as many po people as possible. So big uh, institutional reform to distribute land. And, and the conflict I mentioned before, since 1968, is actually uh, trying to attack these same things. Uh, it was mostly leftist, guerri leftist guerrillas 
uh, influenced by the, the Soviet Union and all these ideas and wanted to a more fair distribution of the land. Just like the case in the Cienega, all the infrastructure and all the economy have, have made a very powerful elites in Colombia, whereas the local population has been largely uh, left out of these progress things. Um, in these pictures, you can see um, the idea of, this is from 1957, when they were constructing the main road. This is the idea of modern that people had in mind. Uh, engineers, people uh, uh, using technology to be able to uh, to achieve progress in society uh, is much. Uh, these people saw much better opportunities in exploiting uh, the agroforest, the agro businesses in the Sierra Nevada than incrementing the fish production. At the same time, the government was um, um, getting involved with the uh, with all the conservationist efforts worldwide. So here in this little table, you can see all the conservation and how they were being implemented in the area. While at the same time, they were um, being con uh, infrastructure was being constructed to to actually eliminate the Cienega and make it more productive in the terms of of modernity. Oops. In the local scale, well, it's not. I actually wanted to zoom a little bit. You cannot see very. This is an aerial photography from mid '60s. And these two points you can see here, this one here and this one here, are the populations that live in the middle of the Cienega. Um, here is much more clear <laughs> how they look like. And so these fishermen, as I say, arrived in the 1850s. They are here, they were there mainly um, fishing and they have lived in very poor conditions. Their access to drinking water, as I told, this is estuary water, you cannot drink it. Um, has to be very communal. They had to get uh, to agree to be able to search in their boats upstream the, the fresh water for consumption. Um, and for example, the sewages were, were all left in charge of the local fish. <laughs> so so it, it was very, very not um, adaptive to, to, the, to the environment. It's what uh, uh, the Colombian sociologist Orlando Fasborda has called an amphibian culture. Um, and uh, with the construction of the, of the highway, as you uh, it's not that clear, but all these are small settlements that were only possible because the, the highway was there. Uh, and the construction of the highway made that the, all the sediments from the rivers accumulated and created this, the Isla de Salamanca, the Salamanca Island. And it attracted more people to the area, area uh, mostly fishermen who uh, have been using uh, lots of garbage to create also more land filling and be able to settle in there. They have no access to water. They have to, to depend on the, on the water being brought by, the, by tanks from other cities. And uh, these people living in those areas is mostly fishermen. Um, but however, they were not seen as modern, as productive. But the statistics I found is that before the construction of the highway and all this infrastructure, uh, they were producing in 1969, 27,000 tons of fish per year. And in the decrease in the production is very evident in 1982, uh, 1600 tons per year. So it's very, <laughs> it's very clear how it, it, um, it decreased. Also, during the 70s, they were the, the main producer of fish for the whole area, 70%, and they also had an accident to, to give to the other parts of the country. So it, it was not like they were not productive. They were producing, just not in the idea that uh, the government discourses wanted. This little fish over here is a Notarius Bonijay, or Chivo Cabezon, and he's in charge of cleaning all the Cienega. So I really like this. <laughs> um, really quickly, because I have no more time. <laughs> This is, the, this is the Cienega, this is a map from 1975, and this is the area that's for the banana cultures, uh, for the banana crops. Um, the bananas, uh, is in the agrarian reform, land was tried to be sh uh, distributed among small peasants. However, this plan of agrarian reform failed miserably, mostly because of water. They did distribute the land, but they did not distribute the irrigation systems. Therefore, the peasants were not able to ac access easily to water. Um, what uh, big owners and elite did was start planting palm oil tree. 
Uh, and as you know, they say it is a very adaptable uh, for the area. It is not. It requires 400 to 600 liters at each pump per day. And what they do is that they flood the entire area, uh, leaving tons of um, uh, oh, pesticides and uh, all other kinds of agrochemists that go into the Cienaga. And at last, in this area, uh, happened was related with something called the Bonanza Marimbera, and it was a decade in between the 70s and the 80s, where Colombia did uh, <laughs> discover something that has been uh, very damaging for uh, the rest of our history, and is that uh, trafficking of drugs has very profitable. So uh, Santa Marta Golden was, no, uh, was uh, known the species, the kind of marijuana that was grown in that area. Apparently it was really good. So it had a very, very large sales in the US. And this economy only strengthened even more the, the local elites. Uh, yeah, the water, and uh, this is just to say the water decreased. <laughs> Uh, from the income of river water. In the 90s, really quickly and I'll finish, <laughs> um, what happened is that the, all these issues of inequalities and unequal distribution um, resulted in what has been known as a nutcracker. Um, more than 750 tons of dead fish appear in the surface, uh, surface of the Cienaga in 1995. Um, the, the fishermen tried to go upstream to eliminate all the, um, all the infrastructure for water. Uh, the very powerful um, elites had already made, get, got involved in the overall conflict in the rest of the, of the country, and some armed actors were in the area. Uh, sadly, uh, this area has proven fundamental for the drug trafficking and also to guarantee the land ownership from the big elites. It resulted in five massacres, um, hundreds of homicides, and tons of an entire population being displayed, especially between 1999 and 2000. Um, uh, I find this is what the National Center for Historic Memory uh, in, uh, commissioned this painting from one of the inhabitants of the steel towns who lived there, uh, who was there in the day of the massacre in 2000. And it's, I think it's uh, very saying that the painter decided to show uh, the, that the death of the, of the massacres of the people came along with the death of the fish, even though these processes were not co-occurring. One was in 95 and one is in the 2000. So it's just to, it's a very beautiful um, um, metaphor to say that how the water people is really there being involved with the, with, with the ecosystem and the changes that it produces. This is just some some the numbers, which are really painful and terrible to look at. And yeah, my conclusion is, as I said in the beginning, the modernity tried to pursue this image of progress, build tons of infra infrastructure, try to overcome poverty, and in the end, it did not not only not achieve it, but also consent, uh, made more land concentration in the, in the power uh, in the hands of the elites, and, and it, it resulted in a very violent process in the area. <laughs>